If it's Thursday, former President Trump has just days to come up with more than $460 million in bond money as the presumptive Republican nominee faces massive legal bills and a campaign war chest that lags far behind President Biden's. Plus, Attorney General Merrick Garland responds for the first time to questions about his handling of special counsel Robert Hur's report on President Biden's mishandling of classified documents and his memory lapses. And in the strongest language yet, the U.S. calls for an immediate and sustained ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in exchange for the release of all remaining hostages as Secretary of State Blinken holds talks with Arab leaders in Egypt. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. We begin with a major cash crunch on multiple fronts for former President Donald Trump. The presumptive Republican presidential nominee is facing a deadline in just four days to post a nearly half a billion dollar bond in the civil fraud case against him. Now, as of right now, he doesn't have the cash and he's running out of time to get it. NBC News reports his struggle to secure funds is frustrating the former president as is the possibility that New York Attorney General Letitia James could start seizing his assets. Mr. Trump publicly has said he has lots of cash, including earlier this week, as he spoke to reporters after casting his vote in the Florida primary. I have some of the greatest assets in the world, and this is a rigged trial. This was a rigged trial by a crooked judge and a crooked attorney general, and we're fighting it out with them. We have a lot of cash, and we have a great company, but they want to take it away, or at least take the cash element away. Now, at the same time as Mr. Trump is struggling to come up with money he needs for his legal issues, new numbers show he also has money troubles when it comes to his presidential campaign. The former president is trailing President Biden's fundraising efforts significantly, with the Biden campaign raising more than double the Trump campaign in February. Now, of course, these numbers do not show the whole picture. There are groups that raise money on behalf of candidates as well as their respective parties. And just last month, Mr. Trump's daughter-in-law, the newly minted Republican National Committee co-chair, floated the idea that the RNC could pitch in to pay Trump's legal debt and that voters would be happy to help. Do you think paying for uh, President Trump's legal bills is something that would, is, is of interest to Republican voters? Absolutely. That's why you've seen a GoFundMe get started. That's why people are furious right now and they see the attacks against him. They feel like it's an attack not just on Donald Trump but on this country. You can't have a country and call it the United States of America that goes out of its way to target political opponents and try to bankrupt them and take down their companies, take down their families. So yeah, I think that is a big interest to people. Absolutely. Meanwhile, President Biden seems to be reveling in his opponent's cash issues, joking twice in the past two days about Trump's mounting debt, first at a fundraiser last night in Dallas and then again just this afternoon in Houston, telling the crowd, quote, the other day a defeated looking man came up to me and said, Mr. President, I need your help. I'm being crushed with debt. I'm completely wiped out. I had to say, I'm sorry, Donald. I can't help you. But cash is not the end-all, be-all of presidential campaigns. While Mr. Biden did outraise Mr. Trump in 2020, Hillary Clinton also outraised him in 2016, an election Mr. Trump ultimately went on to win. Even as Trump's legal battles have brought legal bills, they also bring plenty of free media and a rallying cry for his supporters, something the Trump campaign is counting on as the general election heats up. Joining me now to start us off today, our team of reporters, NBC News correspondent Garrett Hake, NBC News investigative correspondent Tom Winter, and Ali Rafa is outside the White House for us. Garrett, I want to start with you. You were behind this great reporting about Trump's frustrations with his uh, legal and cash problems. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you're hearing. What are sources telling you inside Trump world? Well, the cash problems extend between Trump personally and the legal capacity to the campaign. Right now, they are very much in fundraising mode across the whole spectrum of everything that he needs to do between now and November if he wants to be president again. And I'm told that he and some of the people in his upper echelon, both within the campaign and sort of the broader circle around Mar-a-Lago, are frustrated to be in this position. And as I sit here right now, there's still not a clear answer of how they're going to get out of it. They've tried to, uh, some of
of his allies have hit up some of the major donors to suggest the possibility that people could guarantee his bond. That has, as best I can tell, fallen flat. Uh, they've not been able to win over the courts. They, they have this emergency mm -hmm. appeal that could either be answered at any time or just ignored between now and Monday. And they seem to have ruled out the possibility of declaring bankruptcy, something that I don't think has any uh, political appeal to them. So this is very much an open question. And while it's all being asked and debated, we're not seeing Donald Trump. We haven't seen him on the campaign trail other than that brief clip you showed when he went to vote on Tuesday. And we don't have any public events scheduled for him any time in the near future. Money is job one right now for the Trump campaign. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. There's talk of seizing his assets. And as, as you're noting, Garrett, he's been quite fiery about that. Mm -hmm. That could potentially energize some of the supporters around him. But that would be extraordinary. It would be extraordinary. And I think there's a there's a, another good question to ask here, whether Letitia James wants to go down that road yeah. for fear of kind of stirring up the hornet's nest here. And remember, I think we should sort of expectation set here. I don't think even in that scenario you'd see somebody come in and padlock Trump Tower or take the sign off 40 Wall Street or something like that. What you'd be more likely to see are liens placed on these things. You might see bank accounts sealed, the kind of thing that we might frankly only have a visual of if Donald Trump posts about it on Truth social. And so there's an opportunity for him here to kind of try to make this into part of his cause, the idea that he's been unfairly targeted. But I think we see this somewhat in the fundraising numbers where his donations from small dollar donors have gone down over the course of his campaign, but also just generally in the sort of phase we're in the campaign. There may be diminishing returns for stoking that level of outrage. The universe of people who are deciding who's going to be the president as opposed to who's going to be the Republican nominee is quite different. And so while that's worked very well for him so far, it may not continue to work in the same way the further we get into the calendar. It's a really great point, Garrett. And very quickly, I, I keep going back to this point, and we just set it up, which is that, yes, President Biden is out fundraising Donald Trump right now. He's got more money in the bank. But history tells us that doesn't necessarily predict which way a race is going to that's go right. or which way voters going to go. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, having the resources to get your message out is everything, but you still have to have a message that sinks into voters if you're actually going to win. And I think that'll be the challenge for Biden. He's got to reverse his, you know, negative numbers in terms of mm -hmm. his job approval rating. That's something he can do in the job as president for free. That's not a money question here, right? And I think, realistically speaking, by the time this race is over, both of these men are going to spend and their allies are going to spend something like a billion dollars a piece. So Oof. we're talking about money on a scale like we've never seen before in presidential elections. I don't think anybody's going to be truly cash strapped. So the advantage is certainly with Biden here. But is it definitive? Is it the kind of thing that swings this race one way or the other? I doubt it. Yeah. Great reporting, as always, Garrett. Thank Thanks you. for being here in person. Really appreciate it. Tom, let me turn to you. We, of course, have some updates today in the New York criminal case against Trump. What's the very latest, particularly as it relates to those documents that were turned over in this case and the delay that, that occurred there, Tom? Sure, Kristen. So it's all about Michael Cohen. And depending upon who you talk to, he's the, the star witness for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in this upcoming 34-count felony case against the former president. And obviously, the Republican frontrunner, as you and Garrett have been discussing, uh, Prosecution might say their documents are the front runner, but either way, Michael Cohen uh, expects a significant cross examination. What the defense for Donald Trump is going to try to do is to impeach his credibility. And how might they do that? Introduce all sorts of evidence that have already been gathered in the course of a wide ranging federal criminal investigation in which Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to. And then, of course, his subsequent guilty plea tied to special counsel Robert Mueller in his discussions with FBI agents there. And that's a reason, in part, why we're seeing this discussion about the documents today, because Manhattan prosecutors, uh, about a year year ago, and, and even before that, had requested a whole slew of these documents from federal investigators. And at the time, federal investigators turned over every document they thought might be responsive, uh, in, their, in their view, uh, to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Uh, fast forward to January of this year, Kristen, and it was Trump who served a subpoena on that office uh, asking for additional information of federal prosecutors. Some of that information federal prosecutors got after they were requested it and provided information to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Some of these requests were different and new, and some of these requests uh, had to do with things that the Manhattan District Attorney Office uh, says that they already had or had turned over. Uh, all told, they say, and they say their review is still ongoing here, that 270 
pages of over 170,000 documents are relevant to their case in their belief, and of that, 172 pages are tied to Special Counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. Of course, that's not connected to this particular case at all. So we'll continue to see the back and forth that uh, will play out here uh, on the docket, Kristen, and then eventually have a hearing on Monday, uh, which might go a long way to explaining how all this uh, happened, whether or not it's ultimately really relevant to how things proceed going forward, what the judge might do, and of course, the ultimate question, when we might get a trial date here. Yes, uh, we will be watching very closely. Let me just follow up with you very quickly, Tom, on that final point. Tell us specifically what is going to happen at that hearing on Monday, and could we get a trial date potentially then, or no? Are we still in a holding pattern? Yeah, I fully expect that we'll get some information as to whether or not there's going to be a trial date, whether or not the judge wants more information, whether he wants the defense to give them a little bit more time and, and wants them to have a little more time to review some of these documents. I think all that's going to be made crystal clear on Monday, Kristen, and we'll have a much better sense of where this is going. Of course, with the delay that's already been entered in this case, we're running into Passover, and then there's the logistical challenges which you well know, involving the Secret Service and somebody who's a presumptive nominee, nominee excuse me, and of course, just getting everything together in time to, to have this in lower Manhattan. So there's a lot of different moving parts here, and I do expect to get some inclination from the judge, a, a trial date here, if not an exact date on the books. It's all going to be focused on these documents and some additional disclosures, by the way, uh, that were made from some other figures in the case that haven't gotten as much attention. So that should all likely be addressed on Monday. The judge very strictly saying this is the only thing we're going to be talking about. So uh, the idea of presidential immunity that's come up in this case and other things, the judge has already said, I don't want to talk about that at all. All right. Well, we'll check back in with you on Monday to get the full update there, Tom. Yeah. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that. Ali Rafa, let me turn to you. I read that quote from President Biden clearly pouncing on former President Trump's legal or I should say financial troubles right now. Is that going to be woven into a stump speech? Is that going to become part of the strategy? Because right now he's saying this at closed door fundraisers. That's right, Kristen. And you mentioned that this is now the second time President Biden has made that joke. And it follows this shift we've seen over the last few months where the president during these private closed door off camera fundraisers is much more sharp in his criticism of Trump. He delivers uh, these much more sharper attacks, whereas his public remarks, he is still sometimes referring to Trump as his predecessor and not even uh, specifically naming him. But this was last night, the first time that we heard him lean into former President Trump Trump's finances and how they relate to his legal troubles. We know that there was a decision made by the Biden campaign months ago not to take advantage of his legal woes uh, as political ammunition. But last night's comment was revealing in the sense that it showed that the campaign is now seeing these two as separate and they're seeing that we'll Trump's finances here. are fair game strong, to be attacked by President uh, Biden. So it's going to be interesting to see whether we see more of this, whether we continue to see this in private fund raisers or whether this spills into more of the public view. Uh, but sources close to the campaign tell me today that they don't think that President Biden even needs to seize on this. They say that the Biden team has a near constant flow of ammunition against former President Trump from Trump himself in the form of his comments at rallies, in the form of his comments on his social media platform. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Biden team goes forward with these financial remarks, Kristen. It certainly is. And just very quickly, Ali, there's going to be this unprecedented, massive fundraiser next week featuring all three Democratic presidents, former President Obama, former President Clinton, set to join President Biden. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, this fundraiser taking place uh, at Radio City Music Hall a week from today in Manhattan. Uh, and it really offers the Biden campaign an opportunity to reach out to Democratic donors from across the party's spectrum. Also, donors of all ages, as we see the Biden campaign continue to try to reach out and make some inroads with young voters. Uh, so part of the thinking behind having former President Obama as well as former President Clinton, in addition to obviously President Biden, is to reach a 
wider swath of uh, the Democratic Party. And it, this, ex, this fundraiser ex, is, is expected to be extremely, extremely lucrative, uh, with uh, at least 3,000 people expected to be in attendance and more than $10 million expected to be raised, Kristen. Yeah, former President Clinton was referred to as the explainer in chief in 2012 when he helped then President Obama win re-election. So they are making it very clear they're going to be a part of this effort. Great conversation, guys. Thanks so much. Garrett, Tom, and Ali really appreciate it. Coming up next, we are turning to a different kind of cash crunch. The clock is ticking again for Congress to pass a $1.2 trillion spending package with a government funding deadline tomorrow. I'll talk to a Republican lawmaker about that and a whole lot more. Plus, Attorney General Merrick Garland breaks his silence, speaking out for the very first time after taking heat for releasing the full report by special counsel Robert Herr. That's ahead. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Attorney General Merrick Garland is defending his decision to allow special counsel Robert Herr to include language about President Biden's memory in his report. Herr cited the president's, quote, poor memory last month while explaining his decision not to bring charges tied to Mr. Biden's retention of classified documents. President Biden, the White House, and a number of Democrats said Herr's assessment was unfair and out of line. Attorney General Garland also faced criticism for allowing her to include that language in his public report. Garland responded to those criticisms for the very first time today in an exchange with NBC's Ken Delanian. Take a look. Did you think that that was appropriate, the language that he used to characterize the president's mental state? Look, they, I said from the very beginning that I would make public the report of, the special, of all the special counsels appointed during the period of my service. That is consistent with the regulation which requires a special counsel to explain what the special counsel's decisions are. The idea uh, that uh, an attorney general would uh, edit or redact or censor the special counsel's explanation for why the special counsel reached the decision that special counsel did, that's absurd. NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian joins me now. Ken, thank you so much for being here. Great job thank you so much. with that question. That was just extraordinary to hear him talk about it. Basically, the special counsel report is written for the attorney general to say, here is how I arrived at this conclusion. And what you just heard the attorney general say is, uh, why, how could I possibly censor that because obviously the public has an interest in reading this report. What did you make of his answer? So he didn't actually endorse the language that mm -hmm. her used, obviously, but my sense of what he was saying was that it was within the bounds of an explanation. It wasn't gratuitous. And essentially, that's what the career Justice Department official who reviewed this when Biden, Mr. Biden's lawyers complained about it, that's what he decided as well. And Garland deferred to him. And I think Garland is defending that decision. It do you think this could potentially be an ongoing issue for the attorney general? How are people viewing this within the DOJ world? I think in terms of the her report, it's basically over. But in terms of Garland's relationship with the White House, that may be irreparably damaged. There is no love lost uh, from the White House to the Justice Department. They make jokes about it over there. Like, none of them are going to be working in the Biden White House. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, if, if Mr. Biden gets a second term, it would not shock anybody really to see a different attorney general. It is just remarkable because uh, just to remind everyone, Attorney General Merrick Garland appointed a special counsel for former President Trump, appointed a special counsel to look into allegations against Hunter Biden, appointed a special counsel to look into these allegations of uh, the ways in which President Biden handled classified documents. It, part of his strategy, it seemed, Ken, was to try to say we're going to approach this from the fairest place possible. That's right, and and they are very um, pleased, I think, with, with, and satisfied with those decisions, and will defend them and think that they handled it by the book. But you know, the White House is not happy with the direction that some of those things spun off in. Yeah, no doubt that some of the language in that report would have political implications. Ken Delaney, and thank you so Thanks, much. Christine. Great to see you, and great question again. Well, it is a busy day on Capitol Hill with must-pass spending bills working their way through the House and Senate, all while Ukraine and Israel aid remain stalled, and House Republicans appear to have stalled in their impeachment inquiry into President Biden. 
Joining me now is North Dakota Republican Congressman Kelly Armstrong. Congressman Armstrong, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Well, I want to start with the ongoing impeachment inquiry into President Biden. There was another hearing, as you know, yesterday with some of Hunter Biden's business associates. Here's what your Republican colleague, Mike Lawler, had to say this morning on MSNBC. Obviously, Congress has oversight responsibility uh, and should uh, continue down that road. However, that does not mean that we should go towards impeachment. Uh, I have yet to see uh, any evidence that would warrant uh, the rise to impeachment. You obviously drew up the resolution to open the inquiry, but do you agree with Congressman Lawler? Well, I agree with Congressman Lawler that currently we don't have the votes, votes on the Republican side to move forward with impeachment. We, The difference between this and a normal investigation is we obviously run up against a political clock. So eventually, sometime at some point in time in the future, Chairman Jordan, Chairman Comer are going to have to decide when we final, when we button this up, whether we continue to go for more interviews, more evidence, more uh, documents. I personally think we should be working to get the uh, audio tapes from uh, Special Counsel Her moving forward. But that's the difference between a political side and a legal side, is they're going to have to decide when it's time to write the report and figure out and move forward with whatever that report says. So just very clearly, you have not you acknowledge there hasn't been a smoking gun yet. No, I don't. I've, I've always said that this is the problem with large scale financial cases. They're almost fair, whether it's political or not. There's never what people call the proverbial smoking mm. gun. That's not how these cases get proved in almost any courtroom anywhere in the country. I, I acknowledge the fact that we do not have the votes on the Republican side to move forward with impeachment. I think that's just a math reality. That, that, I mean, that is a, a really uh, fascinating thing to hear you say. And I guess the question becomes, how does this end then, Congressman, if you still don't have the votes this many months into this inquiry? Well, I don't know if you say but it's this many months. We haven't finished the inquiry yet. That's the difference. That's where you have the difference between the investigative pressures and the investigative avenues you take versus the timeline pressures and the political pressures and moving forward. I mean, I think there's obviously people that we have interviewed. There are different circumstances mm -hmm. that we have sh that we have showed that clearly will um, probably warrant some criminal referrals uh, amongst the people that are dealing with these things. But that's really going to be up to Chairman Comer and Chairman Jordan as to how they want to finalize this and present a report to the Republican. Conference. I do want to get to the, the, your point about criminal referrals in just one moment, but very quickly, just bottom line me, if you could, Congressman, do you anticipate that there will ultimately be a vote on impeachment? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't I don't like to ballpark anything in, in this Congress until I mean, we have a two vote majority and all of that. But I can tell you, as it stands right now, there aren't the votes on the Republican side to move forward. I know that now. OK, uh, you talked about criminal referrals. Can you give us an indication who would be the target of those criminal referrals? Well, sh sure. I mean, from the very standpoint, I mean, one of the frustrating things to me as somebody who used to do this work for a living is I keep hearing about all the legitimate business activity and all of the different things that are going on. And yet we have all these SARS reports. We obviously have taken money from foreign governments in order to influence American politics. Uh, foreign Agent Registration Act comes to mind immediately. Um, obviously, I, I still to this point, after doing this for, since I introduced that resolution inquiry in December and even before that, nobody's ever actually told me what the legitimate business purposes. Uh, that sounds great, but with just the speed and velocity in which this money was moving um, from foreign, foreign entities and oftentimes adversaries to different people, a lot of them members of the Biden family, uh, there are some real implications to that. Well, and again, there, there hasn't been a link established between uh, Hunter Biden's business dealings and his father. So just specifically, can you are, are, when you talk about a criminal referral, who are, are you talking about? Hunter Biden, who specifically are you talking about? Sure. Hunter Biden is business partners, the people who are engaged in this. I think I actually I mean, I haven't seen the uh, sealed documents, but I am pretty confident in saying that one of the reasons the original plea deal fell through is because of uh, projected immunity for five FARA violations. And I think it's clear that they were taking money from foreign agents trying to in influence American policy without registering as foreign lobbyists. Well, and, and just to be and again, nothing has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt at this point, but just very quickly. So it would end at Hunter Biden. You're not planning any criminal. Well, Hunter Biden, and his, his business, business associates, associates, all but of you're that. Not that's planning not, I'm not saying okay. that's worth ends. Right. I'm saying that's where the evidence that we have now, I think, shows pretty clearly. OK, I want to um, move on to uh, the, the 
talking about some money matters now. You're a member of the Republican Study Committee. Uh, let's talk about the budget proposal. It was unveiled today. It includes raising the retirement age for younger Americans from uh, retirement. Is this something that you support, and do you have a number? What do you think the retirement age should be, and, and do you back this budget? You know, I, I know it came out this morning. I haven't saw, seen it, but I, I think this is one of my frustrations when we end up in all of these spending fights. We don't talk about mandatory spending. We don't talk about the health of Social Security. We don't talk about the health of Medicare. We don't have yeah. to talk about the health of Medicaid. We don't talk about those things. And some of those are entitlements. Social Security obviously is not. When you pay into it, you get it back. But as somebody who has a 16-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son, if we don't figure out ways in which to deal with these programs in the in the future, then we're going to have real structural problems and the benefits will be cut for everybody. So I always appreciate it when people are willing to do it. I know the political the, the political ramifications of that stuff coming through. But even in all the spending fights we've had over the last eight months, until you start talking about mandatory spending, we are not really getting under into the issue of the thirty four trillion dollars in debt. C Congressman, you know, Donald Trump, uh, the Republican uh, presumptive nominee, uh, has been murky on the details of this. On CNBC, he said there's a lot to do on entitlements. He later said he would not touch Social Security or Medicare. Do you think he needs to clarify his position? Should people know exactly where he stands and what he wants to do on entitlements? No, and I think the appropriate place to start this is you're not going to touch it for anybody who's currently on it, close to the age of retirement, and that is really, really needing those things now. But if you want to look to the long-term health and viability of those products, one of the reasons Social Security has structural problems is a great reason. We're living longer, healthier lives. But with that, and we have changing demographics in the workforce and all of those things, the problem is it's a 20-year problem in two-year election cycles. So I understand it. I think uh, President Trump actually agrees with the vast majority of the American people who are currently on or near the age of Social Security or Medicare. And I don't disagree with that either. But I think having reasonable, responsible salute our conversations about what those programs look like 20, 25, 30 years from now is something that we actually got elected to do and not we shouldn't hide from it. Speaker Johnson has a plan to keep the government open. Will you support his plan? Will you be voting to keep the government open? You know, we got it at 3 a.m. last night. I was very, very critical of Speaker Pelosi when we got jammed. Thousand-page bills at, at, at dropped on us and asked to vote with them in 24 hours. I can tell you, if I don't have time to get through all of this, it's going to be really difficult. I'd feel pretty hypocritical voting for it without reading it when I was so critical of it at last time. So we're going to try to do everything we can to get through it in my office here and move forward. But this is, I mean, this is not the way to do this. I understand Speaker Johnson's been put in a bad spot. It's the toughest job in politics, but really, really asking members to vote on 70 percent of government funding within getting the legislation in less than 24 hours is just, I mean, it's not the way to run government. So you're not a yes yet, but you're not a no. That's what I hear. Yeah, that's I mean, I, I mean, there's some things in there I've as studying it. I've already liked They've plussed up. They've plussed up, obviously, military pay, something near and dear to my heart. Federal federal or federal public defenders got a bump, which they desperately need to administer uh, justice. But there's also tons of things in there that you don't like, which is always the case in these omnibuses. So it always ends up being a weighing of those of the totality. And you can't weigh the totality until you've read the bill. All right. Congressman Kelly Armstrong, I really appreciate your perspective. We'll stay tuned and see what happens. You all have until Friday to get this done. I really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Coming up next, Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaks to reporters after meetings in the Middle East as the U.S. tries to ramp up pressure on Israel by calling for an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Egypt today for his sixth visit to the region since the Israel-Hamas war broke out in October. While in Cairo, Secretary Blinken met with several Middle East leaders, including officials from the Palestinian Authority, before he heads to Israel tomorrow. It comes as the U.S. is putting forward a draft U.N. resolution calling for an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza that is tied to the release of all the remaining hostages still being held. It's the strongest language put forward by the Biden administration to date, which has used its veto authority at the U.N. to block other ceasefire efforts in support of Israel. During a joint press conference in Egypt, Secretary Blinken said the U.S. continues to work towards a ceasefire, including ongoing hostage talks in Qatar. 
But he also reiterated that an Israeli military offensive in Rafah would be a mistake. There's a clear consensus around a number of shared priorities. First, the need for an immediate, sustained ceasefire with the release of hostages. President Biden has been very clear that a major ground operation in Rafah would be a mistake and something that we can't support. Um, there is no place for the many civilians who are massed in, in Gaza, uh, in Rafah, excuse me, uh, to go to get out of harm's way. Uh, and for those that would inevitably remain, it would, uh, it would be a humanitarian disaster. Joining me now is NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez in Tel Aviv. Raf, thank you so much for joining me. So give me the key takeaways here. We know the secretary had meetings with Arab leaders in Cairo. He's heading to Israel tomorrow. How much can he actually get done on this trip? What are the real tangibles here? So, Kristen, the secretary is making a couple of positive indications when it comes to those ceasefire talks underway right now in Qatar. He has said he believes that the gaps between Israel and Hamas are narrowing. But perhaps more importantly, we're learning tonight from the Israeli government that CIA Director Bill Burns will be in Qatar tomorrow. Secretary Blinken will be here in Israel. The CIA director will be in Qatar. He'll be meeting his Israeli counterpart, the head of the Mossad, as well as the prime minister of Qatar and the head of Egyptian intelligence. I've got to say, Kristen, it seems unlikely that the CIA director would come all this way if it looked like these talks were going nowhere. So that is the good news, as it were. The secretary also trying to pave the way for something longer term beyond that ceasefire deal, which would be, as far as we understand it, a temporary ceasefire for six weeks. He is trying to get to a place where he can tell the Israelis, if you agree to end the war, if you agree to move towards a two-state solution, there will be a big prize on the other side, and that is the possibility of normalization with key Arab states like Saudi Arabia. And the hope is that that will convince the Israelis to move in the direction of two-state, something they've been unwilling to do so far. Kristen. Yeah, Raf, based on my conversations, that is the real pressure point, that chance at a normalization deal with Saudi Arabia. You're absolutely right. I want to ask you about this draft that was submitted by the U.S. calling on the U.N. for an immediate uh, ceasefire in Gaza in exchange for the return of hostages. Do you think and do you expect this will receive support at the U.N.? And I should say calling on Israel. Do you think this will receive support at the U.N.? It's a really good question, Kristen. The politics of the U.N. Security Council can be a little unpredictable. The U.S. says they will bring it up for a vote on Friday. That seems to suggest that they feel confident that they have the votes. Looking back at the previous three ceasefire resolutions, the most recent one was supported by 13 out of 15 members of the Security Council. The U.S. vetoed it. The U.K. abstained. Everybody else voted in favor of an immediate ceasefire. Now, that was a ceasefire without preconditions, not linked to a hostage deal. That is unlike the American resolution, where a ceasefire is conditional on a hostage deal. And the question is whether other members of the Security Council can find a way to support that or if they will be concerned that the fighting will drag on and on and on as long as these ceasefire negotiations drag on. Kristen. Raf, we always appreciate your fantastic reporting. I always say this, but I'll say it again. Please continue to stay safe. We really appreciate it. After the break, March Madness Veep Stakes Edition. We have new reporting on how one of the presumptive Republican nominee's former 2016 rivals has made it onto the short list as a potential running mate. We'll explain. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. There is a new name in the mix for a potential running mate for former President Donald Trump. Florida Republican Senator and Trump's former 2016 primary rival, Marco Rubio, despite Article 2 of the Constitution forbidding a president and vice president from claiming the same state of residency, sources tell NBC News that Senator Rubio is moving up President Trump, former President Trump's shortlist and that a decision could be made by June. We caught up with Senator Rubio earlier today. Here's what he had to say about the buzz. I think anybody who would be offered that should be honored, but I've never spoken to anybody in the Trump world about it. So, so you've never had any conversations with Trump about it? No. 
so, or anybody in this campaign for that matter. So if offered this position, you would accept it? Anybody who would be offered the chance to serve their country as vice president should consider that to be an honor. And that's why I'm in public service. But it's just not, if that changes, I'll let you know, but I've never talked to anybody about it. NBC's Dasha Burns was part of our NBC News team who broke the story. She joins me now from Florida. So, Dasha, fantastic reporting. I, I loved hearing from Senator Rubio there saying, yes, it would be an honor, but he hasn't spoken to anyone about it. So just how seriously is the Trump campaign considering him? Look, according to the sources that we've talked to, this is serious. And look, the long list of contenders could probably fill an entire season of The Apprentice, Kristen. <laughs> but yeah. he is moving up that list quickly, especially considering some of his uh, qualifications here. Like, he's young, he's telegenic, he's had more experience in federal office than current Vice President Kamala Harris. And he is the Miami born son of working class Cuban immigrants. And this is a time when former President Trump feels pretty bullish about what he could do with the Hispanic voter demographic and certainly a high profile name uh, like Marco Rubio. He would be the first Latino on a major party presidential ticket that certainly could help uh, with the Hispanic vote. And uh, you mentioned the um, slight hitch there that they are both Florida men. Well, Rubio could potentially resign his seat and move. Uh, that could solve that problem. So something that's a, a, a bit complicated, but not something they couldn't uh, solve for, Kristen. That's for sure. We remember that former Vice President Dick Cheney moved his state of residency so that he could serve with former President George W. Bush. Dasha, it, just to remind our viewers, though, Trump and Rubio were fierce rivals back in 2016. It's hard for a lot of people to see them on the same ticket. And you're also reporting that they could be eyeing a potential announcement or there's speculation maybe in June. What are you hearing? And how long is the shortlist at this point? I mean, I love how you put it, that there are a lot of names under consideration. Yeah, look, uh, Rubio is a, a serious contender. They did have uh, some terse words for each other back in 2016. You remember the derisive nickname Little Marco. Rubio yep. also went after Trump for having small hands. But it seems like they put that feud to the side over the last several years. And other folks on the shortlist, uh, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, Senator Tim Scott, and retired neurosurgeon Ben Carson. Those are the names that I'm hearing a lot. We know that Trump's going to be auditioning them over the next coming months to see who does well yeah. at rallies, who can help fundraise, which is, of course, a major concern mm -hmm. for the campaign right now. He's going to let the reality show play out, though, if we, if we know how the former president does things. Oh, Kristen. I would not be surprised. All right, Dasha Burns, thanks so much. Great reporting. Appreciate it. Joining me now, my great panel, White House correspondent Flip Bloomberg, Akela Gardner, NBC News political analyst and host of What a Day podcast, Juanita Tolliver, and Republican strategist Garrett Ventry. Thank you to all of you for being here. Garrett, I have to start with you <laughs> and basically ask you the same question I just asked Dasha, which is what is the reality check here? How seriously do you think former President Trump is considering this? Yeah, I think he's considering a ton of options at this point. This has been an ongoing story, really, even before a vote was cast in Iowa. Everyone was speculating what Donald Trump's VP choice would be. I think it was because of his commanding lead, and then he wiped out the competition. Now he's essentially the nominee. I do think if you take a step back here, I think he likes Senator Rubio a lot. He's an effective mm. communicator. He is very experienced on Senate intel and a number of other things. And listen, President Trump has been known to fight with people like Lindsey Graham and become great allies later on. So that does happen. I think the president's going to draw this out a little bit here. I think that's what he likes to do. You saw this with his Supreme Court picks. I think he'll do the same thing with his VP here, kind of draw this out. I think at the end of the day, he's going to look at someone who's loyal, who can add something to the ticket, uh, who can go out in his experience and implement his agenda as well. Is it a problem they're both from Florida? And I don't mean from that, right. it, from the technical standpoint, but right. from the political standpoint, sure. to have two people from Florida, there, you're giving up that shot of having two different states. There's a there's a delegate issue there. There's a constitution issue there, so it's tricky. Also, Senator Rubio, I mean, you're talking about... Uh, uh, you know, Donald Trump's up in the polls right now, but you're giving up a prize Senate seat potentially here as well. That's something that's tough. 
And if you're President Trump, I think he much, you know, after everything that's going on in New York, I don't know if he wants to move to New York and New Jersey anytime soon. Yeah, that's a very good point. Juanita, weigh in here. How would Democrats view this? Obviously, he would be a powerful pick from the perspective of courting uh, Latino voters, other voters of color. I think Democrats will be quick to launch onto the fact that Rubio is also someone who Trump can control. Look mm. at how he treated Vice President Pence. Look at how he planted a target on his back on January 6th. And so I, I think Democrats will raise questions of why would Marco Rubio want to subject himself not only to the bullying that he experienced in 2016, but to whatever efforts Trump may have in mind to undermine constitutional rights or a future election. And so it doesn't seem as though this is a good fit. I, I do think there is something to the fact that, yes, courting Latino voters who have been more and more looking at the Republican Party more seriously, I think, is a factor here. But when you think about the reality of the job under someone like Donald Trump, as well as the auditioning process, I appreciate Dasha for <laughs> emphasizing that. I, I had a little chuckle when you said that Marco Rubio is an effective communicator, because all I can think of is the grass fat water moment in his State of the Union Did, rebuttal. Yes. And so I feel like those are the things that Democrats are really going to throw up. Akela, your colleagues at Bloomberg reported earlier this week that Vivek Ramos Swami is now no longer on the list of those being considered. What can you tell us about that and, and any mm -hmm. surprise about that inside Trump world? I think right now he's being considered for other positions right now. He's just being ruled out specifically for VP. Obviously, Rubio is something that you guys are reporting. Tim Scott, Elise mm -hmm. Bonick are still on the list for VP. But in general, I think what's been really fascinating is to see some of these people that Trump has made enemies with sort of come back, right? Loyalty is huge to him. He's known to hold grudges. And we see people like Rubio and I'm sure many other allies he's going to have to tap if he wants to fill out an experienced cabinet if he wins in November. Yeah, loyalty is top of the list for Donald Trump. There's no doubt about that. Juanita, let me ask you about the Democratic side. And obviously you have RFK Jr. running and there's some concern. He's polling in the double digits. There's some concern that his independent bid could take away voters from President Biden. We reported this week that the Kennedy family is throwing their support firmly behind President Biden, including at this St. Patrick's Day event. Look at them there. So many. A lot of green and a lot of Kennedys. <laughs> <laughs> what are you hearing about this? I'm hearing that the DNC is thrilled to have the support. I'm also hearing that the DNC is allowing the Kennedy family to take this on how they want to, right? They also recognize the threat of a third party candidate in this race. They also recognize the threat of RFK Jr. being someone who does spread misinformation regularly mm. in terms of our democracy. And so they're ready to go to bat, not just in this photo, but hitting the campaign trail, doing media appearances. So when the DNC said this picture is worth a thousand words, it's worth a thousand words and multiple campaign stops. I do think timing is going to be the key here about when they engage and how much. But I do think considering the number of politically engaged family members in that photo alone, we're going to hear a lot from the Kennedys in the coming months. Yeah, that, it's a really good point. Garrett, I, I want to ask you about where we started this broadcast, which is we were talking about Donald Trump's uh, cash problems as it relates to dealing with some of these legal matters and also as it relates to fundraising. President Biden is currently out fundraising him. The Biden campaign out with a new campaign memo. They're saying that Trump is basically hiding in his basement as he's struggling <laughs> to raise money. What do you make of that strategy and, and how significant do you think that these cash issues will be a drag on his campaign? Yeah, I mean, hiding in the basement, he was literally just in Ohio at a rally. So I think that's, you know, that's an interesting spin. I don't see President Biden on the campaign trail as much. But I would say this, if you take a step back, he was outspent $1.2 billion to $600 million in 2016. I don't think that was a big deal. He was outspent and outraised in 2020 as well. I think if you're looking here at the polling, I mean, Donald Trump is dominating Joe Biden in six key states that just came out. He's dominated him in the national polling and in the issues. He's breaking into his coalition, too, with African-American voters, with Hispanic voters. So there are big warning signs for Joe Biden here. I think with Donald Trump you're talking about, you can spend $2 trillion against him. He's been well-defined to voters over the last eight years here. And he gets earned media. The guy golfs, you guys cover it. He does anything, you guys cover it. So I think uh, from that standpoint, you're seeing big donors come by, too. He's got a big fundraiser on April 6th with some of the biggest Republican donors who had previously given to Haley and to Tim Scott and to Ron DeSantis. So I think he will catch up very quickly on this. Yeah, it's all going to be about winning over some of those Haley voters. Akela, you know, it's notable that President Biden is starting to take aim, not at Trump's legal battles, but at this cash flow problem that he's having. They're kind of threading the needle. What do you make of that? And do you expect that to be effective? 
I think what they're really trying to tout is how much money that Biden has in this mm -hmm. scenario. To Garrett's point, it's not the end all be all. Obviously, in 2016, Hillary Clinton outraised Donald Trump two to one, and Trump obviously won that election here. But they see it as a huge advantage. This is going to be one of the most expensive elections maybe in history, and they're really using fundraising to hire staff, and they believe this is going to be a ground game. They need people on the ground in some of these swing states, knocking on doors, talking to people, getting those one-on-one -on -one interactions, and you need money to do that. It all comes down to the ground game so often. Well, I need a final note to you. What do you make of this new strategy that we're seeing from President Biden making these quips at closed-door yes, fundraisers? Yeah. Do you think he's going to start getting out in front of the podium and saying this in front of people, poking fun at Remember, Trump's yeah. financial problems? The part, the part of the strategy that is going to be most effective is getting under Trump's skin. So calling him broke Don, that's going to be a thing that annoys him. That's going to be something that he's going to want to rebut and respond to. I do want to uh, address something about the finances, though. I do. Yes, it's about emphasizing how much money Biden has on hand. I do think the legal cases are tied into this as well, considering mm. that he hasn't made bond, considering that he doesn't have as much money that he expressed in these depositions previously, right? So yeah. Broke Don has multiple applications that I think Democrats are really going to try to bring home. All right. Great conversation, you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Akela, Juanita, and Garrett really appreciate it. And still to come, sounding the alarm on AI. We'll speak with a former senior DHS official who helped organize a working about how artificial intelligence could derail the 2024 presidential election. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We're following some breaking news out of Idaho, where authorities say they found two suspects involved in a shootout yesterday that left three police officers injured. One of those suspects was an escaped prison inmate. They are now both in custody. Investigators have described the shooting as a planned ambush. Now, authorities are providing a live update right now. We are following those developments and will bring you any major details as soon as they become available. We want to turn now to new concerns surrounding the forms of misinformation that could shape this year's election. We're talking about artificial intelligence, deep fakes. We got a glimpse into the potential for chaos in the New Hampshire Democratic primary when a robocall featured fake audio of President Biden encouraging Democrats not to vote. The person who made that robocall, which sparked a firestorm and is the subject of a multi-state investigation, said it was scary how easy it was to create. It took him 20 minutes and cost one dollar. Earlier this week, we brought you NBC News' exclusive reporting on an exercise conducted by experts who wargamed what might happen if deepfakes disrupt the general election. One of the organizers of that exercise called the results jarring. And one of the organizers of that exercise, Miles Taylor, joins me now. He's a former DHS chief of staff and the co-founder of the think tank, The Future U.S. Miles, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Talk to me about this exercise. How did you devise it and what were the key takeaways? Well, Kristen, what we wanted to do is make sure that we got a lot of the key players in the room who would be affected by incidents like this if they happen in the 2024 election cycle. So we had media company CEOs, technology CEOs, former senior government officials who've sat in those chairs before and responded to election threats. And we ran some potential situations by them that our experts at the think tank imagine could happen in 2024. Examples of deep fakes uh, showing uh, people destroying ballots at key polling locations in Florida or interactive deep fake robocalls in places like Arizona. And then we created a mock White House situation room and had those individuals play different roles and respond to those incidents. Now, Kristen, I'll tell you, I didn't expect that to be a walk in the park, but definitely these scenarios resulted in a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos, and a general feeling at the end of the exercise that the federal government is not ready for what's about to hit us. Mm. I, the other question as you think about this, Miles, and as you run this exercise, do you think the country should be more concerned about foreign actors or domestic actors? Well, that's the thing. I think in previous election cycles, we would have said the most sophisticated attacks are going to come from nation state adversaries. But this is the very pernicious thing about recent developments we've seen in artificial intelligence is a lot of those sophisticated capabilities 
are now in the hands of individuals. I mean, Kristen, you and I and others remember very well when Donald Trump said it wasn't the Russians, it was an 800-pound man in his basement. That seemed ridiculous at the time. However, years later, the types of things the Russians did in 2016 now are indeed available to a man in his basement with limited time and effort. And that's what we're up against this cycle. And we project that in the coming months in the lead up to the election, we're going to see some pretty serious expansion of capabilities that people can avail themselves of in the AI realm. So we're trying to project those, share those with federal officials and make sure they are prepared for what we are likely to see in the lead up to election day. Miles, in addition to to what you just mapped out, what are some other potential solutions and what can individual people be doing? I mean, should everyone just hit the pause button when you see something suspect online? Well, Kristen, it sounds really banal to say that see something, say something is the right approach. But I will tell you, that actually did work for us when it came to counterterrorism. In fact, I asked for a study when I was chief of staff of DHS at how effective that campaign was. And we found that something like three in four terrorist attacks that we disrupted had a community nexus. In other words, someone in the community said something. Now, that's somewhat analogous to what needs to happen as it comes to deep fakes and AI. We need people to report suspicious activity, but also to go to trusted sources for information about their elections, secretaries of state and local election websites. The last thing I'll say that's really crucial, in addition to preparing law enforcement and federal agencies to actually use technology for good, we also just need wider public awareness. And so that's something that the future U.S. is working on, is raising awareness in those communities that we think are going to be targeted and training them, Kristen, to view these attacks the same way they view malware and spam in their inboxes. The new Nigerian princes asking for you to wire them $10,000 are actually going to be deep fakes. And we've got to develop pattern recognition for that and inoculation to those types of attacks. Miles Taylor, it's Miles. such important information. Thank you so very much. Please stay close. We want to have you back and continue to get updates on this. Really appreciate it. And I will be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. But the news continues with my friend Hallie Jackson. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.